Welcome to Indiana Landmark Center. I'm Suzanne Stanis. I'm the Director of Heritage Education here. Uh, I heard several people remark that this was their first time in the building. How many of you are here for your first time? That's great. Well, we do hope you'll take time, walk down this hallway before you leave so you can see the space that we call Cook Theater, which was a Sunday school addition on the building. And we hope you'll come back for other programs and events. We have a lot of things going on here. Tonight's program is hosted by Indiana Landmark's Historic Landscape Committee. This group of landscape professionals and enthusiasts, chaired by Malcolm Cairns of Ball State University, guides our staff in identifying endangered landscapes and building awareness of their significance within the preservation community. We appreciate their support preserving landscape features, including our park and boulevard system and the Central Avenue Bridge. If you've uh, come to some of our programs before, you know we have this How They Do That series from time to time, and it focuses on um, construction technology and engineering. And since our office is on Central Avenue, I'll have to tell you, our staff had a little bit of fun with the name. You know, we started out with How They Did That, and it's kind of been challenging getting to work for a while, and then we thought, why'd they do that? And then, <laughs> what were they thinking? And then, of course, why'd it take so long? <laughs> But we were all just giddy when we drove over that bridge this summer. It was wonderful. When we look at the Central Avenue Bridge, we know they don't build them like that anymore. Our historic bridges that cross Fall Creek, White River, and numerous waterways really enhance our environment through their design and detail. They lend character to our city, to our city as much as our public buildings and monuments do. So after our presentation tonight, I know you'll join me in thanking the city for taking the time to do this right and preserving those beautiful arches for future generations. So we have two speakers tonight. Uh, our first speaker is David Borden. Since 2012, David has dedicated his knowledge and experience to improving infrastructure in Indianapolis. As Deputy Director of Engineering at the Indianapolis Department of Public Works, David leads the engineering division of 45 staff members in keeping nearly 200 million in capital improvement projects on track throughout Indianapolis. I thought that was just the bridge budget alone, no? <laughs> With more than 15 years of experience improving public infrastructure around Indiana, David's work in the city of Indianapolis includes managing the reconstruction of hundreds of lanes miles of roadways and directing projects that have increased safety for pedestrians, bicyclists, drivers, and people with disabilities. A native Hoosier, David is a proud graduate of Purdue University's College of Engineering, focusing on construction engineering management. David's just as busy outside of work, spending time with his wife Amber, as well as a son and their three daughters. Caitlin Shergalis is a bridge project manager at Butler Fairman Seifert a consulting engineering firm in Indianapolis. She's a graduate of Trine University, having obtained a master's and bachelor's degree in civil engineering. Caitlin has been involved with many noteworthy historic bridge projects at BFS, including the Central Avenue Bridge and the 30th Street Bridge. So I welcome David. Thank you, Suzanne, um, and thank you, everybody, for uh, having me here today. Um, I didn't realize it was going to be a roast of DPW when I showed up, uh, but uh, the project definitely took quite a while, as you guys know, uh, 34 months to be exact. Um, I know this because my phone rang probably on a daily basis the last year of that, everybody asking when is it going to open up. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today or this evening um, is more of kind of the behind the scenes leading up to when we, you know, actually got funding, got a contractor on board. Uh, Caitlin has got all of the good detailed information, kind of the uh, the chocolate chips, of, if you will, of the good the good nuggets. Um, so, DPW manages um, a lot of infrastructure. So just kind of put it into scale of what we actually have. Uh, we manage um, about 8,200 lane miles of roadway. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, is this not on? I like to walk around a lot, so if we got that on, that would be helpful. Uh, so 8,200 lane miles of road. Uh, we have about 540 bridges. This is one of, again, 540 bridges. Uh, 1,140 traffic signals. Uh, about 6,000 miles of sidewalk. Um, if you put all of that together and what our actual need is, I mean, we're talking uh, close to $4 billion in need. So this is a project 
ended up being $5.5 million of construction, uh, $6.7 million overall for the entire project. So how did we fund this? Um, so being a cost that significant, that's not something that we could have undertaken just with our local funds. Um, managing about $200 million a year, I mean, $5.5 million is a decent amount. There's a lot of projects we can do. So what we did is we went to the MPO. The MPO is the Metropolitan Planning Organization. <clears throat> they manage all the federal funds. So we applied in 2011 and got funding. So the funding source and the way that that works is you're actually getting funding five years prior to a project coming to fruition. So you've got to plan ahead. You really got to know what, what you've got in your inventory. Uh, this, this bridge in particular, uh, we you know, built in 1901, so we knew it was obviously time for repairs. Uh, we have done various improvements throughout the years, but leading to a full rehabilitation, um, we waited to the very last second. We couldn't have gone any further. I mean, to be uh, quite honest, uh, the day we had a pre-con, uh, so we have a contractor on board. Uh, we were meeting with them. We're going over some of the final details. Uh, we were looking at uh, utility relocations. That's a big component of you know any capital project that we have. So we decided we're going to go out in the field and kind of just verify where a few last utilities were at. When we went out there, we noticed the sidewalk is not where it should be. It is actually in the creek. Uh, that changed the entire dynamic of the project. Um, it being a stone... Um, bridge, Stone Arch Bridge, the way that it is loaded um, then changed on how they're going to unload it or, you know, deconstruct the bridge. Uh, what they were trying to do was salvage as many of the original stones that as we could for its historic nature, for cost, etc. Uh, so they ended up salvaging uh, about 1,700 of the original stones. Uh, there were another 820 stones that were newly sourced and that had to be done out in Ohio. Uh, Caitlin will get into more of that as far as, can you hear me now that I'm walking around? All right, perfect. So Caitlin will talk more about that. Um, there was, you know, some discrepancy in is it limestone or is it sandstone? So that was something that we had to combat with uh, to where, you know, it had limestone qualities but wasn't necessarily sandstone or wasn't necessarily limestone. So I thought geology was pretty much black and white. Apparently it is not. I guess that's why I'm also not a geologist. So, determined now we have to go to a quarry we have to get stones we have to then basically shape them to fit exactly what the old original piece was so Caitlin's gonna go through there's a lot of drawings there was a lot of calculating a lot of you know craftsmanship going into this uh, that's a craft that's you know it's lost so that's why I'm saying it took 34 months they probably took longer for us to build it reconstruct it than it did originally um, so, but there were several different factors that, you know, came into play. Uh, we appreciate everybody's, you know, patience in, uh, you know, bearing with us as we did this, but we wanted to do it correctly. Um, just, just dealing with, you know, all the different factors that came into play uh, was definitely a challenge. This is a unique bridge for the city of Indianapolis, but a beautiful asset for us. Uh, one of the other um, kind of cool factors is that when it was closed, it was a one-way street. When it reopened, it became a two-way street. So we did a lot of work north and south of there. Um, it carries approximately uh, 25,000 vehicles. So this is a this is a vehicle or a, a, a corridor that travels or carries a lot of vehicles. Um, so this is something that you know was definitely an inconvenience for everybody, uh, not just those that live around it, but those that are commuting. Uh, not to mention all the other work that was taking place in around the time, Red Line, um, all the other we had going on. You work. So definitely an inconvenience, but uh, something that uh, was important to us. Was a, now that it's done, fantastic project. I was out there August 30th, 2019, when it opened. I was uh, trying, one of the first people that uh, drove through was actually Brian Payne. Uh, so he went through, he happened to see us, and I was like, hey. He was just like all pumped up, and it was pretty neat to see all the honks and like waves and everything. Of us. It, was, it was very satisfying to see everybody that uh, came by and uh, appreciated the work and kind of the artistic um, characteristics that that bridge has. Uh, there's some drone footage behind me. You can kind of see, you know, some of the equipment and really what went into this to make it look and feel exactly like it did when it was original. Uh, one of the other things to note. Um, 
that I don't have any footage of but took place um, is one of the cranes actually flipped over during construction. Uh, the operator was luckily safe. Had it moved any other way, he maybe could have been fully submerged and maybe would have lost his life. Uh, but this is a dangerous operation. It's a confined area. You're moving above or working above water, a ton of flow, several, you know, hundreds of thousands of gallons um, on a probably per minute basis. So um, this project was very complex, um, but overall happy with, you know, the team, Caitlin's team for designing this. Uh, we, she worked diligently, uh, worked with uh, United Consulting uh, doing the inspection on that. So thank you to that team and also the contractor to kind of get through this. So. Thank you. Uh, Caitlin is going to, again, provide all of the great information and the very detailed stuff. But thank you guys for your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. Uh, I'm very impressed and thrilled by the number of people that are interested in this project. Uh, and thank you, of course, to Indiana Landmarks for setting up the event and inviting us to come speak this evening. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to uh, just tell you a little bit about myself so that you had some background on my perspective of the project. Uh, first of all, I'm an engineer, I am not an architect, and I think a good way to think about that is we tend to see things in black and white, while architects see things in color. And I would say that my career definitely took a pivot when I had the opportunity to start working on this project. Um, I really learned the importance of historic preservation and I learned also the importance of combining engineering and architecture to make something that was truly unique. And I think in terms of the central bridge, it's really important to understand that this just isn't an isolated bridge. It's just a small component of a much larger historic district within the city of Indianapolis. And before we get started into like the design, the construction, I wanted to start from the beginning and give you some historical context. So the city of Indianapolis, as you know, was founded in 1821. And during its early development, city leaders didn't feel the need to incorporate a lot of parks and recreation areas into the city plan. And a reason for this was the city was very small, so you could easily get outside of the limits to enjoy nature or recreation. However, after the population started to boom during and after the Civil War, so did the city's desire to incorporate parks into the city plan. And at least initially, a lot of these plans were controversial just because they were focused on specific areas within the city. So if you didn't live near that specific area, you were not in support of that park or recreation area. And this is a plot of Indianapolis from 1821. And as you can see, there's only three areas that really have any uh, parks uh, planned out. Most of it is residential. And then as a reaction to the urbanization going on in the United States during the late 19th century, the City Beautiful movement began in the United States. And the intent of this movement was to beautify urban areas within the country as a means to improve quality of life and just general health of its residents. And some good examples of this were the uh, San Antonio Riverwalk, the National Mall in Washington, D.C., and then Grant Park near the lakeside in Chicago. Oops, this isn't working. So, sorry I missed that slide. And as the City Beautiful movement was growing in other cities, 
Indianapolis started to take notice and they wanted to also be a part of this movement. Uh, George Kessler was a well-known landscape architect at the time and he had already done a lot of work in St. Louis, Cincinnati, and Kansas City. Uh, Kessler was hired by the Indianapolis Parks Commission to develop a plan for the city of Indianapolis. And part of his parks plan eventually was adopted in 1909, and it combined some of these ideals from the City Beautiful movement, but it also included some practical functionality. And a big part of his plan was trying to incorporate the city's waterways into the overall vision, and this included uh, Fall Creek and the White River. And beyond just adding this recreation, he wanted to create a network of transportation corridors that would help to guide urban growth around the city, as well as part of, like I said, the practical fun functionality portion was intended on preserving the environment and also protecting the waterways from pollution. And the Indianapolis Parks and Boulevard system was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2003. <laughs> so the incorporation of decorative masonry arch bridges was an important part of the overall vision that the city had along Fall Creek. And the city had this vision even before Kessler put his Parks and Boulevard plan together. So the, the Central Avenue, the Illinois Street, and the College Avenue Bridge were actually constructed prior to the implementation of Kessler's plan. So with these bridges already being built, Kessler took notice and he was, thought it was really important to also incorporate uh, arch bridges for the rest of the structures on Fall Creek. And he actually helped in the design and architecture of the bridges on Capitol, Delaware, and Meridian Street. So the Central Avenue Bridge was actually the first bridge to be constructed along Fall Creek. In 19, or in 1899, the county commissioners put out a request for bids on the project. And at that time, there was an option to bid the project as either a steel truss or as a stone arch bridge. Uh, the city received 10 bids for the steel truss and then five bids for the stone arch. And being that this was the first bridge on Fall Creek, I wonder what would have happened if the project was bid as a steel truss would have all the other bridges fallen in line with that same aesthetics. It could look very different today if that were the case. All right, so that was a little bit about the history of the bridge coming to fruition. And then we fast forward 100 years and the Central Avenue Bridge, as you know, was in pretty dilapidated condition. It had several um, deficiencies in the early 2000s. So the city, like David had mentioned, received federal funding to uh, perform a repair on the bridge to bring it back to its original uh, condition. So being that this is a historic bridge, we had to follow um, some federal regulations. So the Indiana Department of Transportation, they have an agreement with the Federal Highway Administration, uh, the State Historic Preservation Office, and the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. And basically this agreement is um, in place to manage and preserve all of Indiana's historic bridges. And in accordance with this agreement, INDOT and I believe the early 2000s, they decided to put together an inventory of all the bridges in Indiana that were historic. So they were classified as historic if they were over 50 years old, 
And then they were further classified as what we call a select or non-select bridge. So a select bridge are classified as the most suitable bridge types to be preserved and are generally excellent examples of engineering or construction. And then if a bridge is considered historic select, it has special protections under federal regulations. And it's very similar to the National Register of Historic Places. Okay, so for the Central Avenue Bridge, it was obviously designated as historic because it was built more than 50 years ago. And then it was considered a historic select bridge due to its uh, contributing features to the overall historic district of Fall Creek. Being that it's a select bridge, we have to go through what we call a 4F evaluation. And that's essentially looking at alternatives and determining what's most feasible and prudent for the uh, repair of the bridge project. So for the central bridge, we looked at three different options to do the repair. Uh, the first one was no build, do nothing. That's just kind of a standard option and we obviously threw that out. And then the other two options included well, the only main differences between the two options was related to the arch itself. So the central bridge is, consists of a stone arch. And option B would, we would remove that stone arch and replace it with a concrete arch. And then the last option was to remove the stone arch and replace it in kind with another stone arch. Uh, we threw out the last option just because although it was a feasible solution, we did not feel that it was prudent in this situation uh, due to the constructability challenges as well as the additional cost, which was upwards of $2 million. So we have the 4F evaluation report prepared. And the next step in the process is to get involvement and input from the consulting parties. So consulting parties are generally organizations that have a vested interest in the project and would like to provide input and recommendations. And any organization can become a consulting party. And then here I have a list of all the consulting parties on the project. And of course, Indiana Landmarks played a major role in providing recommendations, especially related to the bridge railing and the lighting on the structure. I might actually get the clicker to work once. Okay. And then, like I said, they provided a lot of input on the bridge railing on the structure. So for safety purposes, we thought it was imperative to place a crashworthy railing in between the sidewalk and the travelway, uh, just because there would be a lot of pedestrians on the bridge and the historic railing was not crashworthy because it was mainly consistent of stones. However, we did have the requirement that the historic railing had to be six inches taller than the uh, proposed railing. That way, as you drove over the bridge, you'd still be able to enjoy the aesthetics of the historic rail. And we scoured the list of crashworthy railings available in the United States. And unfortunately, there's not a lot to choose from. They're usually just pretty standard, run-of-the-mill, kind of boring. So this was uh, something that we settled on with the consulting parties. Uh, we painted it black just to make it a little bit more aesthetic. And I mentioned earlier that we were evaluating um, or determining if we should replace the stone arch in kind 
or if we should replace it with concrete. Ultimately, we did decide to replace with concrete. So we had to perform some sort of mitigation on another similar structure due to the impacts that we had on the Central Avenue Bridge. So we selected the College Avenue Bridge uh, mainly due to its close proximity to the Central Bridge, as well as it was also a contributing factor to the historic district along Fall Creek. Uh, part of our mitigation plan was to uh, place repairs on the bridge that would help to extend the life of this historic structure. And we ended up adding drainage to the bridge that helped with overall deterioration, as well as adding scour protection around the piers so that during a heavy rain event, those would be protected. So scour takes place um, when you have high flow in your creek or channel. And essentially, it's um, the movement of the channel is lifting up all the dirt. So then it can undermine your foundation elements. Does that answer your question? Thanks. OK. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm an engineer, not an architect. So I worked with our team of architectural historians on the environmental and historic side, but my main focus on the project was as the engineer of record. And my goal was to try to strike a balance between retaining as many of the historic elements as we could, but also bringing the structure up to today's standards and make it safe for the traveling public. And then my plan for the evening is to highlight some of those unique features of the inspection, design, and construction due to the bridge being historic. And before we get too far into it, I've got a little slide on some of the arch basics. So obviously you have your arch, and then on top of the arch sits what we call arch fill, and that can consist of either dirt or some sort of aggregate. And then you have what's called a spandrel wall, which is essentially a retaining wall that's holding back all the arch fill and or aggregate. And then on top of your arch fill, you have your riding surface or what you drive on. So BFNS started the design of the project in 2013, and it took us about four years to complete all the design. You're probably thinking that that sounds like a really long time to do any sort of design. But honestly, that's pretty standard anytime you have a historic structure involved due to that 4F process that we go through and then getting all the input from the consulting parties it usually takes a year or two to just determine your scope of work and what you're actually gonna work on on the project. And it's also pretty important that we don't rush through this process just because it's so important that we make the right decisions and um, make sure that we're um, selecting the most prudent alternative. And when we first started the project, our scope of work was just to replace everything above the arches, so including the arch, and then all of the stonework we would try to reuse as much as possible. And the first step in our design process was to take inventory of what was the existing condition of the bridge. And we did this through a field inspection. We spent about a week at the site, and we actually measured each and every block within that spandrel wall. 
There's the picture of that. And then we also had to note which blocks were in good condition or which blocks needed to be replaced. And then this is a sketch of one of the pier overlooks. And in general, the pier overlook blocks were in much better condition, and they were also much larger than the sandstone that we found in the spandrel wall. And when we started this project, there were already several deficiencies noted on the bridge. Um, in 2012, uh, part of the spandrel wall and the arch had partially collapsed, and the city and the, a contractor got together and they devised this temporary support to keep the bridge open to traffic while we were still working on the design. And then this is the underside of span B, the center span. And we don't have a record of when it was actually applied, but they applied some sort of shot creek to the underside of the arch. That's essentially a thin layer of concrete. And then on the last span, they actually constructed a reinforced concrete arch below the existing stone arch. And this was done in 1965. And again, it was starting to deteriorate. It had a lot of cracking and a lot of water leaching through the arch. And I mentioned a big part of our design was incorporating a crashworthy railing in front of the historic railing. And part of that was due to, there were already several instances where there was damage to the historic railing through vehicular impact. And honestly, this was a really good example of how we wanted to balance keeping those historical elements on the bridge, but also bring it up to today's standards. And two, like I said, we were trying to reuse the foundation. However, we did decide to take cores of the existing foundation to make sure it was in adequate condition. Unfortunately, the quality of the substructure wasn't exactly what we were hoping for. Um, the foundations actually consisted of three different layers. It had a layer of sandstone, limestone, and then concrete. As you can see in the picture, all of the stone is starting to crack, and then the concrete itself is starting to crumble and deteriorate. So after we did all the inspection and the testing, we decided that it would be best if we also replace the foundations on the bridge. Uh, it just wouldn't make any sense to replace everything above it, and then it's be, still be in poor condition. Then you'd be back out, out the site a couple years later. So essentially, our scope of work changed from, to, from a major rehabilitation to essentially a replacement in kind. So we were trying to replace most of the elements on the bridge, but we wanted to look identical, except for the concrete arch, as the original structure. So we took all those hand sketches in the field, and then we got back to the office and translated that into what we call an AutoCAD drawing. And it was a challenge trying to draw this up to scale and get everything to fit together. It's obviously a giant puzzle piece. Um, and then within the drawing, we shaded the d blocks different colors depending if they were gonna be replaced, repaired, or reused. And as you can see, there's a lot of shading on the lower arch ring blocks. And those are probably in the worst condition because the water is seeping through the arch and kind of sitting at the bottom there. 
So actually all of those blocks needed to be replaced. And then I think David already touched on this a little bit, but one of the great debates on the project was, is it sandstone or is it limestone? And I think it might still be up for debate because I saw in the landmarks invitation that it was classified as a limestone bridge. Well, it's actually sandstone. Um, so you'd probably assume that all of the bridges along Fall Creek are limestone. They're probably from Bedford, Indiana. Well, that is the case for the other bridges, but the Central Avenue Bridge was actually a little bit different. Uh, we hired a certified geologist to classify the stone on the bridge, and they determined that it was essentially a mix of sandstone and limestone. They called it a hybrid sandstone or a sandy limestone. <laughs> so that probably adds to the confusion as well. Um, but they did mention that the primary components of the stone are sandstone. And here I have a picture. The picture on the left is from the Illinois Street Bridge, which is limestone. And the picture on the right is from the central bridge, which is sandstone. And raise your hand if you think you can tell the difference between the two. So it was a lot of controversy on determining the stone type. But ultimately, we did use sandstone based on our geologist's recommendation. And in the end, um, the stone color, the look and feel of it, it does match very well to the existing sandstone. Um, they're actually, I won't go too far into it just because I am not a geologist and I'm not an expert on the matter. Um, I will say they do have very similar compositions. And then, so uh, the existing surface on the central bridge consisted of asphalt, and asphalt is very porous, so water and salt are able to seep through there, they're able to get to the stone, and then that causes deterioration. So one of the major focuses on our new design was making sure that we can prevent water from getting within the arch. And we did this by adding a concrete uh, bridge deck and sidewalk instead of the existing asphalt. And then if water was still able to get th through the surface, if the concrete started to crack with age, then we also placed a waterproofing membrane on the top of the arch so that would protect it if any water was able to infiltrate the arch fill. All right, so now we're on to the construction of the bridge. Uh, the bridge was submitted for a public bid in November of 2016 and it was awarded to ICC for $6.2 million. And this included the work on College and Central Avenue. And just for comparison, our engineer's estimate was 6.9 million. So we were a little bit under budget at the time of the bid. And the project received federal funding, which meant that the State Department of Transportation uh, they were involved in the design and the oversight of the project as well. And then the other 20% was funded by the city. So like I said, the project bid in November of 2016, and about a month after the project was awarded, the contractor and the city were at the site 
and they noted some severe erosion on the bridge. And if you pay special attention to the left-hand side of the spander wall, you'll notice it's a little bit deteriorated, but you wouldn't say that it's immediate danger of failure or collapse. So this is what they found on the site. And our office also got a phone call to come investigate and see what had happened, what that erosion was. And when we met at the site, we decided that the first thing we needed to do was close the bridge to traffic, just to make sure. <laughs> just from a safety perspective, while we could evaluate what to do next. Uh, so it was a Friday afternoon, of course, everything bad happens on Friday afternoon. And we decided the bridge was closed, it was safe. Uh, we would take the weekend to try to figure out what we were gonna do next. Um, we had contemplating adding a temporary support like you saw in the first span to kind of keep it open to traffic because while the project had bid, the contractor wasn't gonna actually start work until later that spring. So there'd be a large window of where nothing could really be done. Well, we came back out to the site on Monday and <laughs> Yes, part of the bridge was in Fall Creek, so there wasn't really much we could do in terms of trying to temporarily support the structure. And it was, it was unfortunate that the bridge had collapsed, but we were really lucky that the contractor and the city were at this site to find this critical finding, uh, otherwise something more catastrophic could have happened if sh traffic was on the bridge when this happened. And there's another shot from the top of the bridge. And I think that weekend there was a major rain event that had happened that really just, the bridge didn't stand a chance at that point. Okay. So we had all that excitement at the beginning of the project. And like I said, this happened in December and the contractor wasn't actually able to get started until May of that year. So there was about a six month window where there wasn't any construction going on. And there, this wasn't really the fault of the contractor. Uh, they just weren't ready to mobilize to the site yet as well as they had to redesign their demolition plan because now they couldn't take heavy equipment near this failure location. So this is the start of the demolition, or we like to call it the careful deconstruction. Um, so all of the stones in the railing were gonna be reused for the most part. They were in pretty good condition. So the contractor had to take each and every stone assign it a number, and figure out how to catalog and store the stones. And at this point, they've removed the line of corbels on the structure. They're starting to take down all of the stones in the spandrel wall. And this was the point where the construction got a little bit more complicated because those stones in the spandrel wall were in much worse condition and of course, the goal of the project was to try to reuse as many of these stones as possible. So there was a lot of debate going on between the contractor and the construction inspector trying to determine if that stone could be reused or if it had to be replaced. And this is kind of what was left of the bridge. You can see all the dirt from the arch fill. And then the line of uh, arch ring blocks were gonna come down with the demolition because none of those were gonna be reused. And then I'd like to cue a video if that can work. <laughs>
So I found the, the demolition of one of the stone arches very interesting because you can see all the effort that the contractor was using to try to demolish this structure. Well, from the outside, it looked like it was heavily deteriorated. It's still like a great testament on how strong that arch really is and how much it took to bring down the structure. And now we're in January of 2018. The demolition of the bridge is completed. And now we're working through the actual new construction of the bridge. Uh, this is a shot of one of the abutments or uh, foundations. And within this, there's 45 steel piles. And then once the reinforcing is put in place, they'll encase everything in concrete. And this is the pier foundation, which is the two center foundations of the bridge. And at this location, we have 36 piles. And this is generally, the foundations are a lot larger than what you would see on your standard uh, highway beam bridge. And that's mostly due because the massive dead load of this type of structure. Uh, if you think about a beam bridge, you just kind of have your beams. But on the central structure, you have this very large arch, and then you have all the arch fill above it which accounts for a large dead load that needs to be supported. Uh, here's some drone footage of the bridge in February of 2018. And I think one of the innovative techniques that the contractor used on the project was implementing a temporary bridge. And you can see that on the south portion of the picture um, they used this bridge to access the center spans and it made the construction a lot easier. And kind of another reason for some of the delay was we had a lot of flooding in 2018. And as you can see from this picture, their temporary bridge is basically underwater um, and of course, they weren't able to do any work due to the high water. So if you were paying attention to the video instead of David in the first part of the presentation, you'll notice that they were putting up the arch beams uh, for this arch itself. So these beams were fabricated offsite shipped to the site and then erected into the position that you see there. And then they had to put up a temporary support to hold everything before they placed the concrete in between those beams. So here's those same beams, but you can see they've started to add the formwork on the underside of those. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna pour concrete in between those beams to create the full size of the arch. Oh boy. And an advantage of using this type of system, it made it a lot easier to level out the top of concrete on the arch. Um, if you did the arch all cast in place at the site, it'd be extremely difficult to figure out what elevation the top portion of the arch had to be poured to. So they could just place the reinforcing and then infill that area with concrete. And now we're in July of 2018. Uh, at this point, they're starting to add the arch ring blocks along the outsides of the bottom portion of the arch. And there's kind of a side view of that installation. And then they're starting to build up some of the piers at that location.
And I think I mentioned earlier that they, we wanted to install a waterproofing membrane on the top of the arch. So the contractor actually started or attempted to apply this waterproofing membrane in November of 2018. And unfortunately, due to the ambient temperatures, it was too cold outside and the membrane was not adhering to the concrete arch. So then they had to take um, about six months where they couldn't do any work uh, just because they weren't able to place this membrane. And a reason that they had to wait before they could do any other work is because you're adding the aggregate on top of that, so you need that in place before you can continue building up the structure. And then in April of 2019, the bridge is finally starting to look like something that resembled what it used to. And this past summer, this is the point where they have all the reinforcing place for that top portion of concrete that you would ride over and they have all the sidewalks in place. The only thing they need to do now is finish the historic railing and add the crashworthy railing. And then in August of 2019, they're putting the finishing touches on the bridge. Uh, they're pouring the asphalt, adding the striping, and it finally opened to traffic uh, Friday before Labor Day weekend. So this is actually one of my favorite pictures from the project. Uh, it really just illustrates the drastic improvement in the work that we did to bring it back to its former glory. Um, as you can see, the existing bridge, it's literally falling into the creek. And then it's just kind of amazing to see what it looks like now. And this is a side view of the bridge and I think they did a really nice job on the stonework because it's really difficult to dif differentiate between what is the existing stone and what is the new sandstone. And we were pretty pleased on how that was able to match up in the end. And then this is a shot of the new crashworthy railing, which you saw a little bit earlier as well as the new Washington style lighting that we placed on the structure. And then if you're wondering what's next in terms of historic bridges in the city of Indianapolis, uh, BFNS is currently working on the design of the 30th Street Bridge over the White River in Indianapolis. And the bridge is actually very similar to the central bridge. Uh, it's actually a concrete arch instead of a stone arch, but a lot of the stone on the side has the same decorative look as the central bridge. And this rehabilitation is just a small piece of the overall larger master plan that's going on for the redevelopment of the Riverside Park area. And in my opinion, this bridge is actually the most impressive bridge in Indianapolis. Uh, it's got ornate overlooks that take you down to the White River, and it's, it's, very, it's much larger than the central bridge. So right now we're kind of working to figure out what the exact scope of work on the project will be. Um, we're working with uh, Indiana landmarks to see if we should reuse the existing arch or replace it. And then we're also talking about which type of railing we're gonna put on the new structure. And then one of the lessons that we learned on Central that we applied to this design was instead of going out and measuring each and every stone on the structure, uh, we employed a newer technology called laser scanning so we essentially 
took a tripod and had a machine that took a 3D image of the bridge. And then we could take that image and import it into a computer. And then we already have those CAD files developed from that 3D image. And it honestly saved us a lot of time and hopefully it'll save the city a lot of money due to that innovative technology. So I hope this presentation gave you kind of a better understanding of how the Central Bridge uh, incorporates into the historic district along Fall Creek and just how everything ties together from that perspective, as well as some of the complexities and challenges that we face, which cause some of the reasoning for the delay on the project. And I think we were gonna open it up for some questions, depending on how much time we have left. Yes, sir. So the question, I believe, was what was the original schedule? And then the, I didn't catch, the, did the contractor? Did the contractor make any money? Uh, so um, one of the components of this that Caitlin kind of touched on is that this project was bid. Central Avenue was part of a bigger project. It was both College Avenue and Central Avenue. Uh, their original plan was to do college first and then do central. Well, this kind of put a monkey wrench into the, the mix, right? Uh, so there was a delay. And then, as Caitlin mentioned, um, they, or I also mentioned, is that uh, you know, the unloading and deconstruction of it, just like a house of cards, right? You have to appropriate, or a Jenga game, you have to appropriately unload that so it doesn't come collapsing down. So it changed the whole dynamic of the project. Uh, so they asked for a significant dollar amount, and we did not want to pay that. So we negotiated for months trying to get it uh, down to what we thought was reasonable. Um, so there were various factors. The uniqueness of this project brought up unforeseen conditions uh, that it lengthened the project significantly. Uh, we were really trying to have it open by November of 18. Uh, as Caitlin mentioned, once we got into that colder weather, that membrane was not able to be placed which then delayed everything above that, which pushed, pushed us basically an entire, you know, next, into the next season. So, and if the contractor made money, I don't know, they bid on other projects for us, so maybe they did. Um, I hope that they did. We want everybody to come out and win on that, uh, but not, I hope they didn't make too much money. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, so the question was, um, where did the, where was the stone acquired for the central bridge? And what was the last part of your question? Just a little bit about what that relationship was, was that supplier, or was that, that kind of very Okay. So when we originally bid the project, we had what we call a special provision. Those are just um, provisions that the contractor is required to follow. And one of those provisions was that they had to acquire the sandstone from a quarry in Indiana. And during the bid process, there was a lot of questions and concerns on the ability to acquire that much sandstone from a quarry in Indiana. So we decided that it would be best to open up the bidding process and allow sandstone to be acquired from surrounding states, so Ohio, Illinois, Kentucky. Uh, and the contractor elected to use a quarry in Cleveland. I think it's called Cleveland Quarries. And they were able to fabricate the large quantity of sandstone that we needed on the project. Yes, ma'am. Ah, that is, it's projected to last um, for at least the next 100 years. That's what we are hoping for. So hopefully none of us are going to have to ever do anything like this again. Um, now there's going to be, you know, obviously minor repairs and maintenance that will be taking place. But 
you guys will not have to endure another two and a half year construction cycle in any of our lifetimes. Um, yes, sir. No, absolutely. So the question was, or comment, then kind of question. Comment initially was before this project took place, you know, it was a one way street. Now it's a two way street. And now you have inbound, outbound traffic that are now not having as many lanes in those peak hours. Uh, so the, then the question was, are we looking into, and, you know, what are we considering? So the answer is yes, we're looking into what we can do. Um, we're actually commissioning. Uh, a vendor now to look at all of the one-way, two-way streets in all of downtown, including um, what we have done and what we're proposing to do, to kind of see how everything works. And everything works as a pair. You can't really change one street without doing its counterpart and looking at that. Um, so there, there's a paradigm shift between um, us being a car-centric community uh, to now people um, want, and what I hear primarily is they want a more village community-like atmosphere for uh, kids, uh, for bike riding, for multimodal transportation, for recreation. So we're trying to balance these two. Uh, another large component is just the traffic signals, the timing, and the age of that infrastructure. So as I mentioned previously, uh, we have nearly 1,200 signals. Um, I think the ballpark figure to redo all the signals was $30,000 or something. It's, it's a large number, okay? Uh, so we're looking at what we can do to, um, and with the technologies that we have today and hopefully will have, for better communication, for better flow, um, as cars become more smart and they become, become autonomous, that will also help with that. Uh, with public transit becoming more of an option, hopefully we're going to reduce the amount of vehicles so we don't have problems like that. But yes, we understand that it's a problem. So we can get everything somewhere. And getting at a level of service acceptable. Yes, ma'am. Um, again, that was going back to uh, different uh, requests uh, from community members, uh, from counselors. Uh, that was a lot of the input that people were desiring. Uh, so we looked into, was it feasible? Uh, does it make sense for, again, not just focusing on cars, moving cars, but more of a multimodal community? And it was feasible, um, and that was kind of the voice of the at large community of in that area, but that this is what they were wanting. Yes, sir. How much original record did you have on the construction of that bridge in 1905? <laughs> so uh, he was asking how many original records or plan sheets that we had from the original construction. Uh, well, we had one plan sheet. <laughs> uh, in comparison, the rehab that we did, there was about 40 plan sheets. So there wasn't a lot of information that we had access to when we started the design. So that was another um, kind of complexity to the project because the contractor didn't really know what they were in for until they started deconstructing the bridge. So, I mean, there was a lot of surprises that they found that we weren't anticipating just trying to get everything to fit back together because we didn't have a lot of those existing dimensions. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that, that, so the question again was how, how long are we expecting to, for this bridge to last? And so um, maybe she didn't believe because it's a, a hundred years is what we're projecting. Uh, we squeezed every ounce out of the bridge. Um, I mean, I don't think we could have actually could not have gone any further. We we went to the very last bit. Uh, so that was a long life that that bridge lived. 
um, using today's technology and then keeping uh, the aesthetics of it and the historical nature, this bridge is going to be standing for quite some time. Any more questions? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think we're going to have to stop. Okay. Thank you. So I'd, I'd just like to thank Caitlin and David, and maybe if you want, if you can stick around for just a couple of minutes, if you've got burning questions, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer those for you. Thank you so much for everybody who came out. Uh, thank you to our members. If you're not a member and you'd like to help save meaningful places uh, and bridges and design landscapes, please consider joining Indiana Landmarks. And check out our website. We've got a lot of other activities and events coming up in the month of December. So thank you very much for coming.